appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. I want to preach a message entitled very simply this morning, Are You Ready? Paul said, I'm now ready. Now, I ask the question of myself, and, and I ask it of, of, of all of us gathered here today, are you ready? Uh, as sure as we're here, gathered here together this morning, eternity draws ever closer with every tick on the clock. With every second that, 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 that goes by, eternity draws near. It's unescapable, with nothing we can do about it. That's what's happening. The only thing we can do is be prepared for it. Many in this world are not prepared for eternity. And, and again, uh, I, I would ask the question of us here, though, this morning, are we ready? Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you for loving us. And just thank you, Lord, for our guests here this morning. And pray that, Lord, you have a blessing suited for them. And I want to thank you, Lord, for allowing us to, to host, uh, host them here this morning. I thank you, Lord, for all that are gathered here today. Lord, those that uh, uh, took time out of their schedules. And, Lord, just have gathered together with the saints of like precious faith. And we just pray that, Lord, you give us all ears to hear. Holy Spirit of God, we want you to be welcome in our midst today. Please meet with us. Stir our hearts. Uh, give us the things out of your word that will help us to be better uh, followers of you, better lovers of you, and better servants to you. We ask humbly, that's already been asked several times here this morning, that if there's anybody among us who is not sure that heaven's their eternal home, or who is not sure where eternity will find them, uh, Lord, today, that they might come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, be saved, forgiven, and have a home in heaven when this life is finished. We ask you to be glorified in our midst. Father, please help me to please you in everything that I say and do from behind this pulpit. I pray that, Lord, you'd help me to be a blessing to your people. And we ask all this in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And you may be seated. The question uh, uh, that I asked this morning, are you ready, comes from the statement uh, uh, of conviction, uh, of confidence, of security uh, that the Apostle Paul made in verse number 6. For I am now ready to be offered. The setting here is Paul has been brought before the Romans. Uh, he has been found guilty uh, as a proclaimer of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and his execution date is set. He is now uh, awaiting execution. And, and again, that might terrify some. That certainly would not sit well with me. I might be a little bit nervous about that. But Paul said to Timothy, as he wrote to him, he said, I'm now ready to be offered. There was a confidence in Paul's statement. There was a, a security. Uh, as Paul wrote these words to Timothy, he said, Timothy, uh, I've got a few uh, uh, things I want to say to you, uh, a few uh, uh, commands, uh, a few points I want to make and, and, and pass on to you before uh, my time ends. He said, but I want you to know something, Timothy. I'm ready to be offered. I, I, there's no doubt in my mind. I'm ready to face whatever's ahead. And, and, and that ought to be the confidence that's held uh, uh, deep within the heart of all of us here this morning. I don't know what's going to happen five minutes from now, five days from now, five months from now, five years from now, but I, it doesn't matter to me that I don't know because I know that my God knows. And I know that whatever he allows to come my way, that he is going to be there in that midst. And, and so I don't have to fear that. I don't have to fear tomorrow. I don't have to run around like Chicken Little screaming, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. Even if the sky does start to fall, guess what? I know the one that's going to hold his hand over my head or hold me up by his hand. I'm not worried about that. And I should not worry about that. Why? Because worry is sin. We've got a God, amen? I've said this before in so many different ways. But you know what? If you're a Christian here this morning, you don't have problems. You have opportunities for God to step in and make the necessary corrections. You have opportunities for God to step in and show himself mighty. You have opportunities for God to step in and make himself and his glory known. We don't have problems. We don't have problems unless we don't have a God. But if we do have a God, we have, we have someone uh, that stands with us. And if God be for us, uh, Paul said, who can be against us? It doesn't matter who's lined up on the other side of the ball. It doesn't matter who's lined up on the other side of the, uh, uh, the, uh, of the great divide there. If God be for us, it doesn't matter who's against us. And we know that through Jesus Christ, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. 
So Paul makes a statement, and, and before he makes a statement, let me just touch on the verses that, that we read before. He said I, uh, to, to Timothy, uh, and again, these are the, 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 this book and, and, and the, the book preceding it, 1 Timothy and Titus, are known as the pastoral epistles. These are uh, Paul uh, giving a, uh, a charge and giving uh, uh, wisdom to uh, Timothy and to Titus as they enter the ministry. He said... Uh, he, t- he told Timothy in verse number two to preach the word. Uh, he didn't tell Timothy to preach his philosophies or preach examples or to preach a, a public opinion or a popular opinion. He said preach the word. It's the word that does the job. It's the word of God that changes heart. It's the word of God that brings people to salvation. It's the word of God that pleases God. Again, And so he told him to preach the word. He told him to be instant in season, out of season. I mean, wherever he's at, be ready to tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, 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 preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Why, why, why are you telling me this, Paul? Timothy might ask. He said, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. I believe that time is upon us. By and large, the world has turned away. Uh, what, what, what goes under the guise of Christianity is nothing, uh, nothing even close to resembling Christianity. But the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Tell me what I want to hear. I think one of the greatest compliments I've ever got, I've never let it go to my head, was somebody said I was fearless behind the pulpit. I want to be that way, not afraid to preach whatever God lays on my heart to preach. And, and again, I know it might not always be popular, but I'll tell you what, I want it to be right. I want it to come from the Word of God. And let me just say this, uh, regardless of what I preach, it, I'm not preaching to be mean to anybody. I, I hate sin. I hate what sin does. And so, yes, I'm going to thunder against it. And yes, I want to I want to make an appeal, a very passionate appeal, a very powerful appeal to you uh, that you better check. we better check ourselves uh, and, and the sin that we allow into our lives. Why? because it will do nothing good for us but separate us from the love of God and, 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 and destroy our, our testimonies in our lives. And so we, we need to be very wary against sin. So uh, he, he said, you know what, there's going to be a time coming, uh, uh, Timothy, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but they're going to uh, uh, turn to their own lusts and heat to themselves teachers having itching ears. Tell us what we want to hear. We ought not to be in that state where we are more concerned about uh, having something comfortable preached to us but having the, the truth preached to us. You know, when I go to the doctor, I don't want him to shine me on and lie to me about my condition. I want him to tell me what's wrong. Don't always like what he tells me, but I'm glad that I've got an honest doctor. If I didn't have one, you know, I'll just take a couple of M&Ms. You'll be fine in the morning. Well, I probably would be, amen. I like M&Ms, but uh, that's not going to be a curative for any, anything that might be ailing me at that time. I, I want him to accurately diagnose and accurately prescribe what I need, and that's the preaching of the Word of God. It accurately diagnoses us right where we're at and gives us a cure. Preach the Word, be instant in season, rebuke, reprove, with, uh, exhort with all long-suffering doctrine. That's what we need, pointing out our sin, showing us how to get right from it, and, and exhorting us to stay straight. And so he told Timothy these things. He said they're going to heat to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they'll turn away their ears from the truth and be turned unto fables. He said, Timothy, you've got to stand in stark contrast to that. You keep preaching the truth. You keep preaching the doctrine out of the Word of God, and, and let, the, let the heretics go, and, and let those preaching heresy, and let the, uh, uh, the soft soapers go, and, and those that are uh, uh, giving the people what they want to hear instead of giving the people what God wants them to hear. You, you let them go their way, but you stand strong and you stay straight. And he says, watch down all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and make full proof of thy ministry. And he said, Timothy, do these things. Why? Because I'm not going to be around to instruct you much after this. And he said, for I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. Uh, the, the sentence has been decreed, and, and, I, and I'm just awaiting that day to approach. And I know my end is near. He said, but, but Timothy, I want you to know something. I'm not going to be around to instruct you or to advise you anymore. He said, but you know what? I'm ready. I'm ready. And so I asked the question this morning, are you ready? Well, Pastor Ross, what, what do you mean, am I ready? Well, let, let's look and see why, why Paul, or, or, or maybe some of the, the evidence, some of the, the things that, 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 that Paul looked at uh, to, to prove his readiness to face eternity. He said, for I'm now ready to be offered the time of my departure is at hand. Look at verse number 7. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Why was Paul ready to depart? First of all, because he fought a good fight. That word good there means virtuous and valuable and worthy. He was engaged in a good fight. There are a lot of fights in this world that we don't need to be engaged in. There, there are fights that waste our time. There are things that we pursue after that, that are of no eternal value. We need to be checking what we're engaged in, what we're fighting against. Can I say, uh, I'm, not, I'm not even going to get into Facebook. It's just it's a waste of time. These Facebook fights, you know, the little snippings and snipings and things like that in eternity. Really? 
we, 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 we allow ourselves to get so distracted from the important things and, and get so twisted and torn up about the, 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 the minute details. We make mountains out of molehills and we, we neglect the important things of life uh, uh, to, 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 to uh, I guess, get some sort of self-validation. Paul said, look, he said, I fought the good fight. He said, I'm not, I'm not messing around with the little things. I'm not messing around with the inconsequential. I'm not messing around with the empty. I'm not messing around with the, word, uh, the worthless, but I've dedicated myself to fighting the good fight, uh, the, the fight that was worthy to be fought, the fight that was valuable. Oh, what, what is that fight? How will we def, uh, define that fight? That, that, that fight that we have with sin. I've been engaged in fighting with sin in my life. Again, uh, you say, Pastor Ross, I'm struggling with sin. Good, keep struggling. Keep fighting. When you stop fighting is when you lose. You don't lose because you're a sinner. You don't lose because you, you, you yield to temptation. You lose when you stop uh, uh, trying to get back on your feet and trying to go after God again. Keep, keep, stay in the fight. Keep fighting against sin in your life. Keep fighting against those things that, uh, that would take you away from your love of God and, and the love of His Word and the love of His, uh, uh, of his saints. You, you stay in that fight. Fight against sin. That good fight is not only a fight against sin, it's a fight against this world. Uh, the influences that would seek to, 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 to uh, uh, persuade us and woo us away and to lure us away from the things of God that would cause us to uh, esteem the things of God as, as, as not worth it. Young people, let me just say this. There's many, many uh, weapons that have been aimed at you, many, many things aimed at you uh, that would cause you to regard the things of God as being boring or worthless or regarding the things of God as being for the old people. It is for the old people. But it's for the young people as well. We looked last Sunday night at Daniel. And Daniel, when he made that statement, he, and, and the statement was made about him that he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. Uh, Daniel was a young man, probably 16 years old, said, you know what? I know there's some things in this world that if I engage in will defile me and ruin my relationship with God. I'm not going to give in to those things. And I'm going to purpose in my heart that I'm going to stay on the straight and narrow. We need a, a generation of young people to rise up and say, you know what? I'm not going the way of the world. I'm not going away uh, uh, of, of, the, uh, of those that are not thinking and uncaring and apathetic about everything and anyone. We need to fight against the world and its influences and, and those things that would seduce us away from the things of God. Can I say one of our greatest fights with ourselves? My worst enemy, my absolute worst enemy is not the devil. It's me. And he oftentimes links up with the devil. Pastor Ross, he's our adversary. Yeah, he is, but I'll tell you what, it's me on the inside. It, 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 it's, it's the old man on the inside that's always uh, yielding, it, that, 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 that's turning aside, that's, that, that's getting enticed away from the things of God. It, it's a guy that I look at in the mirror when I happen to look in the mirror uh, that stares back at me that, that I realize is when I've got to fight daily. Uh, Paul, uh, when he was applauded by the Corinthian believers, said, I protest by rejoicing, I die daily. The fight that he had to wage was a fight to the death over his flesh that was leading him astray and the Spirit of God that wanted to lead him toward God. Friend, the good fight is fighting with yourself, saying, you know what? I love God too much to yield to my own desires. I love God too much than to give in to my own appetites. I want God in my life more than I want my own way and my own will. Jesus Christ, when he taught uh, the disciples how to pray and taught us how to pray, uh, uh, he, he taught us uh, 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 to pray this way after this manner. Uh, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Not, not my will to be done. Many of us pray with our will in front of God's will. We've got to fight that fight. It's not my way. It, it, can I say this? And I, I've said it. I don't mean it to be trite. I don't, I'm not trying to be harsh this morning. We need to knock self off the throne. We run everything through the prism. How is this going to affect me? How does this benefit me? How, how am I going to feel? You know, it might help us to take our little self off of our throne and set ourselves aside and say, how will this affect God? How will this affect God's kingdom? Would God be pleased with this? Would God be happy with this? Would this satisfy God? Would this, would this enhance my relationship with God and make that the prism through which we look at all things in life? But most are looking at it, well, how is this going to make me feel? Is there any better offer coming my way? Can I do anything uh, uh, more fun than what I'm doing right now without even giving a thought to God? Can I say serving God's not always fun, but it's always best? Well, Pastor Ross, you're not really encouraging me this way. No, the life lived for God is the one that's going to hold the eternal reward. The life lived for self is going to result in nothing but, 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 but a, charred, uh, a charred chaff when it meets the fires of inspection. That good fight is a fight with sin. It's a fight with the world. It's a fight with the flesh, and certainly it is a fight with the devil. We do have an adversary uh, walking about, roar, roaring like a roaring lion, walking about seeking who may devour. We need to make sure that we're not yielding ourselves to temptation to where uh, he has an access to life. We're not giving space to the devil in our lives. We certainly need to watch his influences and, and certainly his temptations. So we've got to fight these good fights. 
Why was Paul ready to be offered? Because he fought the good fight. He knew what he was fighting about and who he was fighting for and who he was fighting against. We're not enemies. But we do have enemies. And we need to take a good fight against them. Paul said in 2 Timothy 2.3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. He also said in 1 Timothy 6.12, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. What do we see from these two passages? First of all, that we are regarded in God's economy and God's, by, by God's estimation as soldiers. What kind of soldier do you want to be? Paul encourages all of us to be a good soldier, amen, ready for the fight, uh, unentangled from the affairs of this life, so we can please whom hath called us to be a soldier. Timothy was to fight the good fight of faith. He, he was regarded as a combatant in this, in this conflict. Can I say this? There's no such thing as spiritual pacifism. Jesus Christ said, you're either for me or against me. And he that doesn't gather with me uh, uh, scattereth abroad. He said, he said, you've got to choose what side you're going to be on. I choose to follow with the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul put it this way, and, and I want to say this uh, in 2 Corinthians 10, 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, not fleshly, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. The weapons that we fight with are not swords and guns and bombs and planes and tanks, but it's prayer. It, 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 it's, it's yielding to the Holy Spirit of God. It's realizing that uh, uh, the fight sometimes is internal. Uh, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. Hey, it's that war waged on the inside where we turn to God and yield to the Holy Spirit of God so we can have victory over those internal things that keep us from uh, uh, serving God as we could. Why was Paul ready? How, how, what, what, what produced a readiness in Paul? He fought a good fight. Can I ask this question? Are you in the fight? Are you fighting? Are you, are, you, are you taking an active fight against those influences in your life that would seek to separate you from, from, from your God? Are you fighting against those, uh, uh, those uh, uh, things in your life, whether they be hobbies or whether they be uh, pastimes or activities uh, that would separate you from, from the things you know that would please God, the, the prayer times, the, the time in the Word of God, the, the gathering t together of the people of God at the church house? These are all things we know that are pleasing to God. These are all things that have been ordained by God for the children of God. Are we, are we fighting against those influences? Are we fighting against those things that would seek to rob us from an affection toward God? Are you in the fight? Am I in the fight? Paul not only was ready for his departure because he was fighting a good fight, but he also said this in verse number 7, I have finished my course. Paul was ready because he ran a good race. He finished his course. What does that mean? He, he ran a good race. He, he finished his course. I'm looking back at Brother Jim Amrose, uh, a good runner. I mean, how many, how many 10K races would you say you've run in your lifetime, Brother Jim? Several hundred. I mean, just an active and avid runner. Uh, the courses were different. Uh, some, some courses I'm sure you ran more than once. You liked the, the setup of those things. But uh, uh, the course held its own uh, unique challenges and, 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 and things like that. But as a runner, you understand what, what Paul's talking about. Hey, he ran the course that was set before him. It was Paul's course. No, no other course is going to be set like Paul's course. That was for him to run. And the course that God's put you on is, is completely different and completely unique to anybody else's. You're going to run a race that God has intended for you to run. He put you on the course. The only question is, are you going to run the race that's set before you? Paul was confident about re being ready to be offered. Paul was supremely confident in this. He said, you know what? The race that God gave me to run, I've run it and I've finished it. I'm, I'm, I'm confident. I've done. I run the race that God's put, me, put out before me. He's in the race. Well, what is that race? Uh, that means that it was his, uh, uh, the cross that God had chosen for him to bear. The, the, the obstacles that God chose for him to overcome. Uh, the, the, the challenges that God called him to engage. Uh, the valleys that God called him to, to, to tread through. I mean, all of these things. The troubles that God called him to, to bear up underneath. I mean, the, the, this was his race to run. Nobody in this room has a, has a, a duplicate course. Everybody's course is different and unique. 
Some have higher mountains to climb. Some have deeper valleys to, 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 to uh, uh, navigate through. Some have more tears to shed. Some have greater physical difficulties. I mean, your, your race is different and unique, but you know what? God put you on it because God knew that in you running that race, it would bring out his glory in a way that nothing else could, and it would bring about a good in you that nothing else could. He puts you on the course that he wants you on, and just trust him in that. Pastor Ross, it doesn't seem fair. You know why it doesn't seem fair? Because we're looking at somebody else's race. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't seem right because we're looking at somebody else. And, and let me just say, we're looking at their race through our eyes. We don't see their troubles. We don't see their burdens. We don't see their heartaches. We don't see their struggles like they do. And to them, their race is the hardest one to be run. So guess what? God puts you on course. Get on that course. Paul said, you know what, Timothy? I've given you all the instruction I can because I'll tell you what, execution day is coming. Uh, uh, the axe is about ready to fall on me, but I'm ready to be offered. Why? Because I fought a good fight. I've been engaged in that fight, and I've fought it to this day, but I've also run the race that God put me in to run. What's the Bible say about this race? Uh, uh, again, uh, in 1 Corinthians 9, 24, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth a prize, so run that you may obtain. Well, the Olympics are going on right now. We're watching some of the, the sprints yesterday, the 100-meter dash and the 400-meter the dash. And well, I'll tell you what, I'd have been about 25 meters and been done, amen? I've been sucking wind there. These guys just running full out, fast and things like that. Uh, sub, sub 10, 100-meter runs, and uh, incredible. But why are they running that way? To get a medal. Now that gold medal might be worth a couple hundred dollars. And the prestige might bring them millions in, in endorsements and things like that. But in the grand scheme of things, what happens when they die? It goes to somebody else. So they're racing. They're, they're running, the Bible says, and we'll, we'll look at it in a second. They're running to obtain a corruptible crown. Something that's going to pass away. Something that's temporal. Something that's only uh, uh, set for a finite period of time. Paul encourages us here. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. Everybody in those races is running to get that prize or to get the gold, silver, or bronze. They're running to get a prize. And Paul said, guess what? Get in the race. Run. Why? So you can obtain. And guess what? There is a crown to win. There are rewards uh, that can be obtained if we'll just run our race. And he says, every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now, if they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. He said, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth. Here, let me just stop right there. He said, I know what I'm doing. This isn't phony. This isn't make-believe. This isn't a fairy tale that I'm engaged in. This is real. Right. Let me just say, I'd like, to, I'd like to shake some of us this morning. Guess what? This is not, this is not a, 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 a beauty pageant. This is not a, a popularity contest. This is real. This is eternity. And this is something we need to gravita uh, get, get a gravity for and get an understanding that what we do has an, an effect and an impact on eternity. The choices we make and, and the things we do uh, affect eternity. And, and, and if we get a hold of that and begin to live in that, in, in, with that idea and, and that truth in mind, it would change and shape the way we live our lives. Don't run as uncertainly. He said, I'm not a shadow boxer. I'm in the ring with, with an opponent. He said, this is real. Young people, again, I appeal to you. Well, what you've got before, you're going to have to decide one day, is this real or is this make-believe? And I'll be honest with you, the many, many young people I have sat in the pews where you've sat, and guess what? They've come to the conclusion that it's phony. But I'll tell you what, when they get out in the real world, they realize how nasty it is, and they realize how friendless it is, and they realize how harsh it is. Why? Because they've rejected and neglected the only friend that they're going to, uh, the, the true friend that they're going to have, and that's Jesus Christ the righteous. The sooner you realize that this is, this is life and death, and this is real, and this is important the sooner you can begin to run your race, amen, and, and, and fight that fight. Paul said uh, in Acts 20, 24, but none of these things move me, neither count on my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish, finish my course with joy and the ministry which I received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of, grace, uh, of the grace of God, that I might finish my course with joy. Where did Paul, Paul's course take him? He was stoned to death beaten with rods several times, whipped, received 39 lashes several times. His own countrymen took out a vow uh, that they would not eat food until they had, 40 men took out a vow that they would not eat a morsel of food until they had killed him. He was hunted like a wild animal from, from basically from city to city, village to village by those that would kill him for, just for the mere fact that he, only, that he was preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, just because he named the name of Jesus Christ. And yet he went on and he said, you know, that's my course. God, God, God called me to it. I'm just going to run it. Pastor, God's not fair. i got a hangnail. I can't run my... God's not fair because I'll tell you what, this ingrown toenail just keep me from doing anything. 
I'm not trying to minimize pain or anything like that or discomfort, but I'll tell you what, if that's all it takes to knock you out or to keep you from running. Wow. We've, we've come a long way, baby. And I'm not talking about Virginia Slims either. And not in a good direction. We're a very soft generation of believers. Go, go, go and read history sometime. See, see what uh, our forefathers in the faith had to endure. And not even the Apostle Paul. I'm even talking in colonial America. Uh, those that uh, dared name themselves as Baptists in colonial America had their church, church houses stolen from them, taken from them by magistrates because they weren't approved by the standing order church. Our Baptist forefathers were thrown in prison because they would not pay a tax that went to support the standing order minister of that, of the, of that village or that town. It, it's in the history books. We, 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 by and large, have an unmolested existence here at 101 Five Lowry Avenue. The police did not follow you in and take your license plate number as far as I know today. They're not going to show up on your doorstep tomorrow and harass you for coming to Heritage Baptist Church yet. The race we've been called to run is not near as severe as some have been called to run. Have been called to run. So what's Paul's advice? Run. Run. Why? There's something to obtain. There's something to gain. There's somebody to run for. There's somebody to run to. There's something in this. When this life is over, our, our work on earth is going to be done. And, and when our work on earth is done, we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ and give an account of the things we've done in our body, whether they be good or bad. And, and, and the fires of judgment will try those. Uh, uh, again, whether they were, they, they were works uh, uh, that, that would uh, endure the fire like gold, silver, and precious stones, or whether those works would be consumed like wood, hay, and stubble, the fire is going to try it. We'll be saved yet so is by fire, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But if you're not going to run the race, there's nothing on that, uh, on that altar that's ever going to endure those fires. So run so you can obtain. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 12, 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Guess what? The race that's set before you, run it with patience. What's that mean? A cheerful endurance. God gave it for me to run. God's going to run it with me. God's going to welcome me home at the end, and it's all going to be good. Amen? I might have some tears along the way. I know I'm going to have some troubles along the way and some struggles along the way, but I'll tell you what, God's going to be with me all the way. He's never going to leave me nor forsake me. Guess what? I can run it. I might stumble sometimes. I, I, might, I might skin my knees sometimes. I, I, might, uh, I might even wander out of the way sometimes, but there's a God that's going to call me back into that race. If I'll just listen, I'll follow him. Amen? Run. Why? We're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. We've been encouraged to run the race with patience. Amen? A hey, cheerful endurance. We know, what's, we know who we're running for and where we're running to. The Bible says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hey, when you get a little weary in your race, just look at Jesus Christ and thank God that he didn't get weary in his race. His race led right to the cross. His, his race led right to the scourging. His race led right to the crown of thorns. His race led right to the betrayal by Judas, the kiss on the cheek. His, his, his race led right to the, the mocking uh, of the soldiers and the scoffing of, uh, of his own people. He came into his own, but his own received him not. Think about the complete rejection that Jesus Christ endured and thank God that he didn't get tired in his race. We've got a great example to keep us going. Can I ask a question? Are you in the race? It's not the race, but can I phrase it another way? Are you in your race? You running? Uh, I'm trying to limber up. Get, get in the race. Go. Run. Run that you may obtain. Timothy, I'm ready. I fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've been in the race. I've run it to its conclusion. The checkered flag's come down. Uh, uh, I've broken the tape. Uh, uh, I've seen the, the white stripe across, across her away. I've finished. I know I'm done. I'm ready. I'm ready now. I've done everything God's called for me to do. Isn't it interesting when Jesus Christ, before he bowed his head on the cross and gave up the ghost, what did he say? It is finished. His work on earth was done. How about you, Christian? God, let me just say, until the fat lady sings or the trumpet blows or the flag comes down, it's not time to quit running. You keep running until God comes back. I'm, I'm tired. Okay, I ask God for the second wind. I'll ask Brother Jim again. You know the experience of the second wind when you're out running, right? You get tired and, and fatigued, and then somewhere along the line, as you just keep running, that energy seems to come back, and the, and the lungs, and I, that was one of the, those are one of the best times you run for that second wind. I remember uh, Dad telling me about that, running over the hills and valleys of Fort Allen. Uh, you couldn't run anywhere without going up hills to get out of there. and You just get, you get weary, but uh, you, you keep running, and sometimes that second wind just comes along and picks you back up, and you don't know where the strength comes from, but it's like that in the Christian life. 
I'm weary today. Guess what? Just keep running though you're weary. Just keep taking the next step forward. The Bible says in Isaiah 40, 31, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And maybe you can only walk today, but keep walking because that second wind, uh, that, that promise of God, the strength returning to you is coming from God. Keep in the race. Stay in the race. The, the second wind, the strength to run, the, the strength to keep walking is not the one sitting on their blessed assurance and, 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 and have parked themselves outside of the race of God, but it's that one that stayed in there, weary but going forward. Pastor, I'm tired. I'm frustrated. Are you running the race? Where's the confidence at today? I fought a good fight. I finished my course. Are we in the race? And lastly, let me just finish on this point. The Bible says, and Paul said, I've kept the faith. Not only did he fight a good fight, not only did he run a good race, but he kept a good faith. The faith. That word keep or kept there means this, and please listen to this important. It means to watch closely, to guard, to keep from escaping. How many people that you should sit where you're sitting today, aren't here because they forgot to keep the faith. They forgot to watch over it. They forgot to guard it from escaping or from, from getting away from them. Can, can I say most people don't just, aren't here just one week and gone the next week like that? It's usually not something traumatic that rips them out of the, the things of God. It's usually the little, the little foxes that spoil the vines. It's the little grains of sands that, 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 that gum up the machinery, that, that, that grind down the machinery. What's happening there? There's, there's no keeping of the faith. There's no guarding of the faith. There's no wa uh, uh, watching over that faith. There's no uh, preventing that faith from, from escaping. Who, who's that on? Is that on the pastor? It's on the individual. I'm doing my, I want to do my job. And, I, and again, I, I want to be a good pastor. I don't think I am. I'm trying, but I want to be a good pastor. I've got a lot to learn. Still have a lot to learn. Pastor, you've been in this 18 years. You better figure out what's going on. I'm trying. Why do they call practicing a medicine, by the way? You'd think they'd figure that out. I, I, I'm just practicing. I want to get to where I'm supposed to be going. I know I'm imperfect. Amen? Just a thought. Sorry. It's like that ADD, you know, squirrel. You know, I'm right there. So um, you got to watch. We, Beck and I heard a comedian, a comedian uh, uh, on the radio, and he said, uh, I was diagnosed with ADD as, as, as a younger person. And he said, ADD stands for attention deficit. Hey, that's a mighty nice looking necklace. Um, um, <laughs> I thought that was hilarious, so yeah, your pastor probably struggles with that a little bit. Keeping, keeping a good faith. Let me get back into our notes here this morning. Guard it. How's your faith doing? The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. How's your relationship with the Word of God? If you're not, if you're not paying attention to that part of your life, your faith could be escaping. You, you, you could be losing that strength and losing that attachment to the things of God by not paying attention to the, the Word of God that's going to give you strength. The Bible says we're not supposed to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as a man of some is. We're supposed to gather ourselves together more and more as we see the day approaching. What day is he talking about? The day of departure, the day of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, 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 of a rejection of the things of God. We're supposed to, as we see, anybody in their right mind can take a look at this world and see it's not getting better. So what, is it, what, is, what are the children of God supposed to do? Keep gathering ourselves together the more and more. Why? Because we know what's going on. We know what we're heading to. Keep an eye on your faith. Am, am I, is my relationship with, my God, with God's word in good standing? Is my relationship with God's people in good standing? Is my relationship with him in good standing? But then I was thinking about this the other day. I'm a destination kind of person. We go on vacation. I, I, I want to get the journey over as quickly as possible because I, I want to get to the destination. I don't know if you're like me like that. No, it's all about the journey for me. Have at it, amen. I want to get there. No rest stops. I mean, I just... Fill the tank with gas, take an apple along, have a bite, and just get there. We took a, fam we took a vacation. We uh, wanted to see Pastor Bish one time. It's about an eight-hour drive up there, and uh, oh, I did not stop for any food. I'm still getting glares right now. The only thing I took with us was an apple, and I told Pastor Bish, I said, yeah, we just stopped for gas and, and, and gassed up. Did you stop to eat? I said, no, I just took an apple with us, and we all shared it. <laughs> my, my true girls? Yes. It's not about the journey, the destination. Can I say, I, I think I'm wrong in that? Maybe not physically, but spiritually. Yeah, it is about getting to heaven. But if we're only focused on heaven and getting there, we're missing out on the presence of God, the whole journey. Wow. So, Lane, there's so many beautiful things we see along the way, so many touches of grace, so many kisses from Calvary that we miss it if we're just getting to heaven. 
We miss the presence of God on a daily basis. We miss the, the sweetness of the Savior as, as we walk along, and, and we're, 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 we're missing some of the, the, the great aspects to the Christian faith. We're not keeping, keeping our eye on our faith. We're not watching over our faith. We're letting it seep out and, and escape so, so quickly, so silently. Thinking about folks that used to sit in these pews that they might come on Easter and Christmas now, but it, it, you wouldn't get much more out of them than that. What, what's happened? They haven't, they haven't kept the faith. Yeah, are they going to hell? No, they're not going to hell. They just haven't kept the faith. The faith that once sustained them, the faith that once carried them through some of their deep valleys and some of their uh, greatest of life's trials uh, that was so real to them in those times has just kind of ebbed away. Ms. Pam, how many, you, you've been here an awful long time. Uh, how many people have you seen that, that, that shared mountaintop experiences with you, that, that you've seen God bring out of deep valleys that, boy, if they make one service a month, they're, they're, they're doing good. Or uh, If you ever see them again, what happened? They didn't keep the faith. This isn't about pleasing Pastor Ross. It's not about gaining my favor or, or my commendations. It has nothing to do with me. There's a God we serve that's watching this and, and a God that looks right through everything and sees right where our heart's at. He says, keep the faith. Watch over it and guard it because I'll tell you what, it's going to keep you and it's going to keep you close to me and it's going to keep things sweet between you and me and it's going gonna, it's gonna to let you know that when things don't turn out like you want them to, that it's okay because I've ordained it and I'm going to see you through it. And when you're tempted to go away, you'll realize I'm the one that's holding on to you and you're not doing the holding. Keep the faith. Paul said, I'm ready to be offered because I kept the faith. Jude put it this way, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Can I say this? What Jude was talking about there, the faith once delivered to the saints, is that which we have today present here at 1015 Lowry Avenue. We have the word of God spoken by God, penned down by the men of God, the prophets of God, as they are moved by the Holy Ghost of God, inspired by God, preserved by God, and lived by the people of God today in 2016. We we ought to earnestly contend for it. We ought to be watching over it. We ought not to let it escape. We ought to highly esteem it. We ought to sell out for it. We ought to live for it. We ought to love it. And if we don't, there's a problem. We're not keeping the faith. And if we're not keeping the faith, we're going to lack confidence when it comes to our time to depart. Timothy uh, was told this in 2 Timothy 1.4, That good thing which was committed unto thee by the Holy Ghost, uh, uh, unto thee keep thee by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. He said, you've been given the faith. Keep it. Watch over it, guard it, cherish it. He was told also in 2 Timothy 3.14, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. Continue, continue in those things that you've learned and been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. What's he talking about? He goes on to say, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction in righteousness, for instruction in righteousness. Paul said, I'm ready, Timothy, to go. I'm ready to be offered. Why? I've kept the faith. The Savior that I met on the road to Damascus, the Savior I'm still following today, the things he taught me, the things I've learned about him, I've kept them. I've not let them get away. I've not turned aside from them. I've not yielded to pressure. I, I've not sought after public opinion. I, I've, not to seek, I, I've not sought to please man, but I've, I, I've sought to please God. I, I've kept the faith. Timothy, when that ax comes down, know this, I'm, I'm ready to go. I was ready to go because I kept the faith. Paul had an advantage we don't have. So it's not much of an advantage. He knew when his, when his day was done. I don't know when my day is done. It might be today, it might be tomorrow, it might be next year, next month, I don't know. Whenever God decides, I go. And because I don't know and you don't know, we need to be ready. How can I be ready to face uh, eternity, Pastor Ross? You can fight that good fight, stay in the battle. Keep fighting against those things that would seek to separate you and seduce you away from the things of God. Fight them. Yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. Submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, he will flee from you. Fight the fight. Fight that good fight. Run the good race that God's given you to run. The cross he's given you to bear. The struggles you're called to face. That's part of your race. Run it. Run it because you know what? God put you on that course and God's going to be with you on that course and God's going to see you through and God's going to welcome you home when your course is done. Run, run the good race. And then keep that good faith. God's given you something special. 
Think about the privilege it is to hold in your hands a copy of the Word of God. Not only a copy of the Word of God, but a knowledge of the importance of Jesus Christ and salvation in light of eternity. And think of how many folks sit in darkness at this very moment who have never had a copy of the Word of God in their language, who don't know anything about our wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, help me to keep that which has been committed to me by the Holy Ghost. Help me to hold on to that. Help me to keep the faith. Don't become a casualty. Uh, st- stay in rank. Stay, stay, in, st- stay with him. You need to be ready too. It's interesting that Paul not only said he was ready, but he said in verse number 8, henceforth, because I'm ready to go. He said, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And I like what he says there at the end of that verse. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. I would submit to you, if we're fighting the good fight and finishing the good, the good race and keeping the good faith, that there'll be a love in our hearts to see the Lord Jesus Christ again. Let's hope there are some Christians I think will be terrified at the coming of the Lord because they've lived lives so far apart from Him. They've, they, they realize where they once were and they've departed from that. And they're not going to be happy to see Jesus Christ because there's not going to account. There'll be those that have loved him and labored with him and struggled through the, the challenges every day that when they see him, oh, that'll be glory. And so good to see him. For our work on earth will be done. Which, will, which, which camp will you be in? The one that's delighting to see the Lord Jesus Christ, the one terrified at his coming? I ran into a, a friend of mine who was a chaplain in the United States Navy. He was, I told our Sunday school class that he uh, was chaplain for the Navy SEALs, uh, went on many missions with them uh, they, they wanted him there w- when they went in and he went on missions with them and uh, when, I, when I saw him on Thursday he came up and gave me a big hug I wasn't afraid to see me, I wasn't afraid to see my friends it was natural and I love the guy and hopefully he'll be here with us for our Veterans Day service, I'd love to have him here have to meet him, wonderful man I want that to be the kind of reunion I have when I see my Savior, not me running away not me putting my head down and having to be coaxed over but a happiness, a joyfulness to see the one that loved me and the one that died on the cross for me. Are you ready? Keeping the faith? Finishing your course? Keeping that faith? That's your choice. That's our challenge today.